Cares. We're telling the stories of Kansas City nonprofits and the people behind them. KC Cares is the intersection of the profit and nonprofit communities, making Kansas City a better place to live, work, and play. KC Cares is proudly sponsored by the Ewing Marion Kaufman Foundation. I'm Ruth Baum Biggis. For 38 years, the Center for Practical Bioethics has been at the forefront of raising and responding to ethical issues in health and healthcare, bringing the most pressing topics to the attention of our community. And beyond, the Center brings forth real life situations for us to contemplate and educate ourselves to make informed decisions about our health and end of life. As a thoughtful institution, the Center for Practical Bioethics often thinks outside the box, and the organization is doing it again for an upcoming special exhibit, The Art of the Wish, capturing, capturing rather ordinary people's thoughts of big questions we should all consider. What's the exhibit about and what inspired the center to go in this direction? Who are the creatives behind this effort? They're joining us here today. John, I'm going to start with you. Lead us off. Give us a refresher all about the center, and then we'll get into this really unique exhibit and event that you'll be doing. Well, thank you, Ruth. This is great to be with you guys and to, to share what we're, the excitement that we have about the event that's coming up uh, this May at the Leedy Gallery at the Crossroads. So the center's been around, as you suggest, uh, for about 38 years, almost 40 now, and I've been there probably about half of that time. And uh, I came to the center uh, in 2004 when we were uh, really involved uh, very significantly in the end of life, kind of what we call our legacy work in decision-making, shared decision-making, advanced care planning, and our commitment to making sure that people at the final chapters of their lives have what they need and are able to kind of receive the care that they want and also be able to be honored and respected for, for what they contributed to the world. But our, our history really goes back at the very beginning uh, to the early days of our founders where they found themselves in hospital rooms taking depositions uh, on, for people that wanted to stop treatment because they didn't feel that it was effective for them. And they'd made their choices about uh, their end of life. And so we had a, this is not a joke really, we had a lawyer, a doctor, and a philosopher who founded the, the organization, and that kind of kicked us off. And we've taken myriad roads, as you suggest, related to all kinds of things related to ethical issues. Our real work is around that ethics and bioethics matter every single day to everybody. This is not an ivory tower, you know, kind of only in the hospital kind of environment. We really believe that ethics is applied every single day in our lives. And we have no better uh, reference point than we do right now with, with what's happened with COVID and the polarization of the American people. And it's, it's around getting people together, you know, convening them, having conversations about what's important and moving forward. So our work is really around you know, applied ethics. We have work right now that's in the area of artificial intelligence and health. We have work around uh, population health and deliberative democracy, which is a kind of bringing people different views together. So we've got lots of different things going on, but this work, the work that we're gonna be sharing um, at the Lady Gallery with Martin and Andy's uh, contributions is really kind of the legacy work of the center. And so we're delighted for this opportunity and for being able to, to host this really important exhibit that I think, um, and I, I know many people believe, could, could change people's lives. So um, thank you for this opportunity. Well, we're delighted as always to bring the center to the forefront and the, the important work you do. And I'm so glad that you mentioned that we're living in times that this couldn't be more relevant and kind of provided a, a broad swath, as it were, for, for many people who maybe thought, uh, that's for later or won't happen to me. And this has happened to so many people. So we're so grateful that you all have been there and, and been a resource. Before we jump into Art of the Wish, and I love, I love that name, you talked about in the early days, it would be three people around someone's, forgive me, deathbed. Uh, how has that changed now? How have you all moved that needle for people in terms of considering end of life uh, kinds of wishes and decision-making? Well, we have uh, our, our kind of hallmark, if you will, the hallmark uh, contribution we make is uh, caring conversations. 
And that is a, a program and offering for people to be able to download for free online or to purchase and basically sit down with their family members and discuss what's most important to them. And what we're trying to focus on is that it's about values. It's about people's stories that we need to understand. And the, the emphasis we put on it for healthcare professionals is you need to translate what those things are that they're saying about their values into medical treatments and not expect them to know everything that's possible related to medical treatments. It's your job as the healthcare professional to interpret and to translate and to elicit those values so that we know what, what should happen. And so we've made tremendous progress in that. We have probably close to probably 3 million of those, of those documents have been shared. We have workshops now. Uh, we just did a thing with the library. We've got collaborators, we've got companies. Hallmark uh, is one of the companies. Evergy is one of the companies that, that provide these services to their employees. So there's tremendous work we're doing in this arena. And we're now uh, kind of branching out into work we're doing with African-American populations and faith-based communities for them. Uh, we've got a, young, a new young professional who's got his hair on fire about trying to do this with the Hispanic community and the Latino community. Um, and he's, because that's a very, very, there's a lot of cultural differences here that those of us who are, who come from the predominant culture and, and you know, white middle-class backgrounds have a different view of end of life as many other people. So, and I'm sure, you know, this is kind of one of the things that excites me about the, the exhibit again, is that Marn and Andy ask those people about what's important to them and what, and, and you saw this, you know, panoply of, of views and desires and wishes and hopes that, that people have. And I just think the diversity is really what we need to embrace and kind of back to, where we are in the polarization, that we need to really embrace the diversity of the American people in kind of this stuff. So we've been hard at work. We got a long, long way to go. We have not fixed this problem. Uh, we still have way too many things done to people at the end of life that we shouldn't, but but we've made good progress. And I think we focus we're focusing on the right things, which is values and principles and and you know how people want to live their lives and what's important to them. Well, I want to bring Andy and Marn into the conversation. Didn't mean to leave you out there, but I thought we ought to set the stage for our audience. Uh, Andy, let's start with you. Uh, sure. How did you first connect with the center? And then I'd love for Marn to ask that answer that as well. Right. Well, Marn and I were fortunate enough. We both worked at Hallmark for over 30 years and we were in creative there. And they have a program, it's called the Barbara Marshall Sabbatical. And you apply for that if you're a member of Creative and they award that to one person in Creative each year. And Marn and I were fortunate in that we were awarded that, that sabbatical. And what we presented uh, to the people on the board at Hallmark for the sabbatical, we wanted to do a uh, a project where we would interview elders across the country. And um, we would ask them about their lives, just have a conversation with them. And in that conversation, we would, we would find out their wishes for themselves, for their loved ones, for the world. And then we would create artwork that would hopefully uh, portray those wishes in a poignant way. And so as we worked on the artwork, the conversations, uh, we pulled together about 50 pieces of artwork, about 50 wishes, and we had that work exhibited at Hallmark. And that's where we initially met this people from the Center for Practical Bioethics. They were in at Hallmark for one of their caring conversation sessions. And when they started to leave, our dear friend, Kathy, who was the security guard at the front desk, <laughs> demanded that they turn around and go see the exhibit. And they did. And they then asked if Marn and I would take them through the exhibit, which we did. And we have been friends and we care about the center. We love the center. We have been partnering with them ever since. And it's been truly wonderful. Marn, that is very serendipitous. It is very serendipitous. It, it was it was great. And our, our first round that we were able to exhibit at Hallmark, we we were so fortunate to have um, people tour the exhibit, but we it was it was closed off to the general public. So we were really um, so excited to meet the Center for Practical Bioethics people through that um, through that experience. And then 
I'll take the story forward. Andy and I retire, and we were so passionate. The idea about this um, sabbatical was to do a passion-led product project. And Andy and I are, have always shared this affinity for older people. Um, and we just knew we wanted to do something around this. So we retire and we weren't gonna retire from this passion at all. So we decided to, to keep it going forward. And so working with the, with the center going forward has been equally as rewarding. It's been great. Martin, how long ago was this? It sounds like this has been a little bit of a journey. It's been a little bit of a journey. Um, 2018, so three, whatever the math is on that, it seems like a long time ago because all the stuff in between. Um, but yeah, it's been three or four years in the making. And now, Andy, can you take us from that initial artwork and concept and work related project to where it is now and then what folks will see. Sure. You know, Ruth, really what Martin and I have both experienced is that this passion project has a life of its own. I mean, it just <laughs> keeps snowballing forward and uh, there are times where we're just like, we're caught up in it, but it's, it's not about us. It's about these elders that we've talked to. And um, we have left each one of those conversations looking at each other going, that was amazing. That was just amazing. That hour or so that we spent with that person um, and so you, you really will see a continuation um, of what we initially did, but uh, it, it will be a piece of artwork that will uh, be showing the wish that that person gave us. And then we'll have a written statement that will go with it also. And the written statement is every bit as important as the visual. And then what happened, I'll give you an example. Uh, we had a, a wish from a woman in Topeka at a uh, elder facility there. And she said, you know, I really wish that everybody had the chance to work on a farm because she had grown up on a farm and loved it and it taught her so many things. And so in response to that, I, Got a friend of mine, Kevin Kozad, who's a photographer, and Marn. And on a Saturday, we drove out to Centerville, Kansas, and we were going to meet with a farmer, 81-year-old farmer, Fred, who lived out there. And so what happened that day is we probably got five more wishes that we did artwork for from Farmer Fred. So it's just one thing leads to another. And, um, you know, without going into more detail, because I could talk forever, you will see those experiences and those stories. And just to let you know too, Ruth, that when we had this exhibit at Hallmark, we had people come in and tears, hugs, they would bring family members in later. Um, and it was, they wanted to share their stories. And that's the thing that I think has been so profound for Marn and I is that you will find something in the exhibit that you will personally relate to. And then you wanna share your experiences also. And that's what we really want people to do is to take the time to listen to each other and share their life stories. Ruth, I'd like to jump in here because I think this is actually captures the essence of this exhibit. The, the imagination and the creativity that they've exhibited is contagious. It's just infectious. And I think that when you see those, those exhibits and you see that story and you just, you just sit there and look at this piece and you think it, it, you just kind of, it swallows you up and you just kind of get absorbed in it. And then you just want to feel like, okay, there's something good that can come from this. I can, I can sit down with grandma or grandpa, or I can, you know, go home and share this. If you're an older person, share this with my, my kids or my grandkids. And it just, I think it's, we, we just need something right now in, in, in this current day and age 
for us to focus on the good and the wholesome and the beautiful and the, the treasured moments that we've had. And so many people have lost their lives in the last two years and never been able to say goodbye. I mean, this is, it's just tragic. And I think this exhibit just kind of says, okay, let's put that aside and let's get you down there and get people talking to each other about what's most important. And this art just does that. Art just kind of opens you up and, and kind of, you know, goes in and grabs your heart and grabs your soul and pulls it out and says, let's do something with this. And I think that's what they've done. Thank you, John. I'm glad you jumped in. I, I really, really appreciate that. We're talking with John Carney with the Center for Practical Bioethics and artist Andy Newcomb and Marn Jensen about this wonderful exhibit, Art of the Wish, and the work that the center does overall. Marn, I wanted to ask you, so you do these interviews with people and, and you listening conversations. How do you interpret and then create that into a piece of art? That's the easy part. <laughs> Actually, I did want to, I, I wanted to point out too that when we started this, we really, we knew the plan for the end game. We wanted to create art and have an exhibit. And people would say, so what does that look like? And the terrifying and the exciting part was that we had no idea. You know, going in, we had no idea. We didn't know what, how many, wishes we would get if they would translate. So having these conversations, which uh, was part of the, the project was give the gift of time to these people who don't always get a moment with people to have this conversation. You know, you, we, we see older people sometimes tucked in the corner and not given this chance. So that was a huge motivation for us was giving that gift back to them. And then we realized, wow, this is equal parts gift for us as well. We'd come away, we'd actually wrote on all of our wishes, we have more than 300 or 400 now, on giant pieces of craft paper, you know, just listed them out. And then, and then it was time to suspend the conversations and now, you know, it was time to make the art. And we were a little nervous that we would want to both execute or create something on the same wishes, but it was it was pretty magical that Andy and I gravitated toward different ones. And they the wishes just point the direction of how the art's supposed to be. I mean, it just it ta it takes you down an obvious path for us, for me anyway, as an as an artist to be able to um to execute around this ideas and bring it to life in a way that only I or Andy would do. And like Andy said, it's equal parts story. So the verbal is equal parts um, and the visual as well. So it's, it's both pieces. Well, I appreciate artistic talent <laughs> tremendously since my stick figures are about as good <laughs> as it gets. <laughs> Those and, <laughs> and but I but I love the fact that the word is there as well, uh, as our mutual good friend Trudy Galbloom would say. You know, we're we're the wordsmith. We we work in words and conversations that are verbal and that you can listen to and watch, but you're converting those things into a, to a piece that sounds like you hope evokes other people to be forthcoming. Andy, I'm gonna to toss it back to you. So how many pieces are in this? And how did you choose to who to talk to? I guess those are two different questions. That wasn't fair. So maybe how did you choose who you talked to? And then maybe Marn will bring us back around and can tell us about the actual works that are in the exhibit. You know, one thing I have, I'm so glad you asked me that because one thing we hear about are super seniors, those that are, you know, can water ski or climb mountains or, and that, that's not what this is. We are here to say that every elder um, is, has validity and has worth. And you don't have to be acting like you're 20 years old to have that worth. Um, and so we had to fight a little bit. I think there was a point in our project where I was like, well, let's get this person uh, that has notoriety or this person. And Martin was the one to say, no, you know, this isn't about that. This is just people, everyday people, because they have amazing stories that we need to unearth, that we need to dig up. 
And so that we really stayed in that, in that realm. And we both, my dad lives at a local elder facility in Overland Park. And so he would set up interviews with people out there for me. And if we were talking to somebody and running late, he would call me and say, uh, <laughs> do it. Come on, get going. You've got people waiting for you. So he was kind of our manager and he's uh, 93. Um, and so we would take advantage of, of those places where we had contacts. Marn had uh, contact her sister uh, knew of someone in Seattle that would uh, get us into places out there. So we did go to different places in the country. But again, what happened is, you know, it started to snowball. We would be, Martin and I would be at Starbucks. I would hear a woman in line say, I just turned 75 today. I want my free coffee. And I'd be like, I have to talk to her. Who, <laughs> what 75 year old woman announces her age loudly in public? And that's, I wanna talk to you. And she gave us amazing stories. And um, so, you know, and then we worked too to, to go to different areas where we would get a different, uh, more diverse audience also. So we really, you know, tried to make sure that we had a great mix of people and of diversity. Um, but, you know, as far as the, the artwork goes and how we picked what we would use, that was, that's continually a challenge for us because we would like to do every wish. And I, because we're getting close to hanging the show, there were a couple of weeks in there and Martin will shake her head. Yes. Where I was getting kind of manic and just like, I got to do three more and it didn't work. I just, I had to calm myself down and just stop and really make sure that I was doing justice to the ones that I picked. And, you know, if this goes forward, which we hope it does in other ways in the future, maybe we'll bring in other artists and writers to contribute. I mean, it's, it can go so far and so big, but right now we just had to pick the ones that really spoke to us, that gave us a visual and focus on those and know that we didn't get them all done, but we have a great selection and it's a beginning. Marn? Can you share with us, since we're not seeing all of them right now, we will in, infuse and use in our social media, but can you kind of describe it in what medium? Uh, artists work in a lot of different ways. So what are, what are some of those things where we are gonna see as the exhibit has its run? This is another uh, something that people ask us about. And uh, most artists, um, stay in a certain medium, and especially for a show. Um, it kind of curates uh, a show that hangs nicely together. This has everything, but Andy and I also, our aesthetic is so similar that the show really um, folds in nicely together. We have, we have drawing, we have painting, we have sculpture, we have fiber art, um, we have encaustic work, we have a lot of assemblage. I work a lot in collage and um, putting the pieces together. Um, so, so it's all over the board, but one thing that is really important to us is that you will see um, this common thread of materials where we love to use old and recycled and vintage antique pieces and parts that already have story folded into them already. And um, we actually, one of our first field trips when we were ready to, to start making art, we went to our favorite junkyard, Asner's, down in the bottoms. And you can bring all of that stuff back to life. And it was a perfect metaphor for us to be able to do that sort of this discarded uh, metal and objects that people didn't see a need for, but we pulled out and you'll see in some of our pieces too. So again, it's, it's, a, real, it's a real varied um, show, but 
it's it's anchored in the wish. Everything old is new again. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> John, I want to jump back to you. Give us the particulars of the exhibit. And I know that you have tied to this an effort to uh, fundraise for the great work the center does. Yeah, we do. I want to uh, thank Martin and Andy. I, the, we have two incredible volunteer co-chairmen for this event, Sue seidler Nerman and uh, Norberto uh, Ayala Flores, who's a local businessman who basically we were introduced to uh, at Sue's uh, invitation. And I met with Norberto and, and we just hit it off. And he is one of 16 kids, okay? And he fell in love with this exhibit. I mean, we had him at the at the moment of we said, this is about wishes for from elders. I think he said he was born in his family. I think he's one of the youngest or maybe the youngest. His parents were 61 at the time he was born or 60s, close to 60. And he has just fallen in love with this event. And I, it, it is, I, I can't tell you how much this is just, it is a contagious uh, <laughs> uh, event. And maybe we shouldn't be talking about contagion right now, but anyway, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it is just exciting. So yes, we are, we're going to have on May 12th, <clears throat> We will have our uh, annual event, which is usually an annual dinner. We usually do this at the Marriott with 600 of our best friends. And this year, we're going to be spreading it out, obviously, throughout the course of the exhibit, which starts with the first Friday in March, I believe, uh, at the Crossroads. We've had tremendous support from the from the merchants down there. And it'll run through the end of May. But our event will actually take place on May 12th. Um, and it'll be um, a, a kind of a, a two-part evening. We'll have a session at the beginning. Uh, it starts about 530 and you'll come for um, basically uh, hors d'oeuvres and experience the stories of the center and also this experience this event till about seven. And then we'll kind of dismiss you and you can go to the Crossroads for dinner. And then the group that went to Crossroads at uh, dinner at 530 will come over and join us at seven o'clock. So we'll have lots of space, lots of distance between people. Um, and we'll we'll make sure that this is as safe as possible for everybody. But this this event really has to be experienced um, in 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 front of each other and with each other. So we're we're going to be uh, allowing people to <clears throat> rather than be crowded around six hundred other people at dinner, we're going to allow us to to set up some some uh, opportunities with different restaurants in the crossroads that are going to be hosting our major sponsors. There's a sponsorship information on our website. We'll be happy to get you all that stuff, and we're going to have. Uh, throughout the course of the of the time, we're also going to be inviting senior groups to come to the to the uh, studio, excuse me, to the deck gallery during the day and uh, allow them to tour. And so we're going to be reaching out to them. Um, Naruto and I start on that next week, I think, uh, going to the different uh, places and saying, bring bring a van down and let your let your elders experience this and, and have them go home and, and share it. We're also hoping to do some intergenerational work with some students. Uh, we're, we're trying to get some creative things going with Sue on that. With the Art Institute, Martin and Andy had that with their first exhibit. So we're really just trying to embrace this whole thing. So uh, we're looking for sponsors. Uh, we're looking for, obviously, for donations throughout the course of this time. But uh, we really want to, this is, this is as much friend raising as it is fundraising for us. And we really hope that the, that the Kansas City just, just embraces this as everybody who's seen it so far has. And information is at your website? At our website, yes, practicalbioethics.org. Just, just Google on it and it should be readily available from, from, the, from the front page. Just go to the, to, to the website and it'll take you to the Art of the Wish. Just Everybody just remember Art of the Wish and you'll be there. Well, I can't wait to see it. And I'm also interested to see where it's going to go because I heard that little uh, <laughs> inkling in there of you hope it has a life beyond here and, and my catch catch on fire in a very good way. Thank you all for sharing this amazing effort that, that you have done together and continue to, to bring us forward and, and you know really capturing the important things in life. Thank you, Ruth. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us for KC Cares. Kansas City's nonprofit voice were produced by Charitable Communications, also a nonprofit, and we're proudly sponsored by the Ewing Marion Kaufman Foundation. Now, if you'd like to be a guest on KC Cares or underwriting opportunities to support our work, 
please visit our website at kccaresonline.org and spread the love. You can find us on Facebook and Twitter at KC Cares Radio and Instagram at KC Cares Online. And catch us on Saturday mornings at 8 a.m. on ESPN 1510 a.m. and 94.5 FM. Thank you for joining us on KC Cares.